So Alvaro is a Spanish architect and PhD candidate at the ETSAM, holding a Master's of Architecture from the European University of Madrid and a BPRO MArch in Architecture Design, the MArch AD, from the Bartlett School of Architecture at University College London. Uh, prior to moving to London, Alvaro has worked with uh, RNA and L ALF Architects in Madrid. He has wide ranging uh, experience in digital manufacturing, working for Be Made at the Bartlett School of Architecture in the digital manufacturing department, and with some collaborations with different projects like the Swiss Pavilion for the Venice Biennale in 2016. Uh, and the uh, digital grotesque for the Pompidou Center. As a researcher, he runs the robotics lab at the Architecture Association, where he has uh, participated in many experimental projects. Currently, he co-directs the RC9 unit for the, B the Bartlett Prospectives uh, Architecture Design Master's degree at the Bartlett School of Architecture, whilst working as a digital manufacturing consultant for different offices like Nagami Design, I believe in Japan. So Alvaro, thank you very much for making the time to come very along. Much for uh, you, you, are, you are a busy man. Yeah. So uh, I, uh, yeah, I would ask you then to share with us what you've been up to. Uh, and, uh, and then after that, we will uh, is start uh, the the presentation of the posters. Okay, share my screen now. Okay, and presentation. Okay, can you see my screen? Please? Yes. Good. Excellent. Perfect. Yeah. So uh, as Rel uh, was saying, um, have a like a, since I graduated from the Barlet, I have a wide experience in digital manufacturing in different areas. Uh, I started, or when I started my research, I was more focused in automation for architecture. So I was more uh, dedicated to 3D printing. In fact, I started, or the project I'm going to show today are more based on different types of 3D printed uh, uh, projects. So for example, this is uh, my first attempt. I was a part of masters. Uh, we did a thesis about 3D printing concrete, but in this case, we were aiming for a high level of intricacy uh, and very high level also of uh, freedom for design. So we started from a modular perspective. So basically, we started the project by thinking about how we could control this intricacy based on a series of voxels, analyze those voxels, and then generate a series of patterns uh, that will be uh, filter and analyze by uh, an algorithm in order to generate a toolpath for for the printing method. In this case, was pure concrete, uh, almost no, like just some bit of uh, plasticizers or for pumping process, but it was a very, very standard concrete. And also, we approach this uh, from the uh, discrete perspective. Like, uh, one thing we realized uh, when we were doing this research project is uh, even 3D printing kind of, kind of looks like, or initially, initially it looks like a continuous method. It shouldn't be because that is, in fact, one of the problems all those 3D printing projects have is you need to have a bigger machine than the house you're going to 3D print. In most of the cases, there are some ex exceptions, but that is usually the norm. And we were also against that because also our resources were very limited uh, by then. So basically, we approached this uh, from a discrete perspective, perspective, and then we did this uh, early prototype. So we did two separate pieces, and then we arranged them in this sort, sort of uh, coffee table or something. Like that. Uh, you can see where the clean uh, um, joint we got. I mean, obviously, it was a bit post process, but. Uh, at the end of the day, it fixed very well and it's very, very steady. Uh, then for the final proposal, we went for something bigger, obviously, and then we went for these six uh, pieces, uh, three meters tall column, uh, which uh, obviously is not as precious as the table because the time constraint affected the process a bit, but uh, the whole idea was the same. Uh, 
the most interesting, the most really interesting part on this uh, project was that we decided to print with a form. So basically, we achieved this efficiency by using this granular sort of material that we use as a form work during the 3D printing process. Uh, I'm saying that because this is a kind of evolution in my research. So uh, basically, we started with 3D printing on a form work, and then um, this is just an example of some vision for the creature we were aiming for. And then we jumped into the next step, which would be 3D print the form work for concrete. Uh, in this case was the Swiss Pavilion. Uh, for the Venice Biennale 2016, and was curated by Christian Keller. And I ended up in this project because I had this experience in 3D printing with concrete uh, previous projects. And then they copied from the TH in Zurich. And then we started to elaborate a sort of file to generate all the 3D printing parts for the pavilion to analyze how accessible they were, if we could 3D print them, or we could see and see them. We also was by then was also a possibility. So then you can see like some analysis of how we would uh, face the project in terms of uh, sectioning the areas. And then we ended up with something like this. Uh, we basically ended up reprinting the whole formwork system. Uh, as you can see, what we are reprinting is the, the like the inner layer of the formwork because we were spraying on top of this. So basically. We 3D printed those molds and then we applied uh, some sort of concrete uh, uh, fiberglass uh, reinforced concrete, but not in a GRC way. It's not exactly GRC, it's more, um, let's say, sophisticated than that, since it, it would need to be applied by hand, unfortunately. So we basically had those amazing guys uh, applying the concrete uh, manually on top of each uh, 3D printed mold. That it was a very key thing because it's one of the origins when I started to think that automated things should do should be done in a probably different way. Uh, then we ended up with all those uh, 300 something pieces. I don't remember 330 something. Don't remember exactly uh, pieces, uh, 3D printed pieces. And then we ship to Venice. They were all produced in Zurich, so they will move to to Venice at some point. And then we assembled the whole pavilion on site. Uh, that's like it's a, an exterior view. And then the interior view, which uh, I think is, we, we were pretty happy with the result. Like in a way that the whole idea was to achieve this stone-like uh, finishing. And, and we got very, very close to what we were expecting. Uh, so at the end of the day, it was a, we were very happy. I wouldn't say it was a full success, but very close to a full success in a way. Um, and then the next step, which was to actually 3D print the, the concrete. And the, well, not precisely concrete, but concrete-like material. So in this case was the second version for the, the Tiger Desk. In this case was directed or was created or um, um, probably the work. Anyway was an uh, uh, exhibition organized by the Pompidou Museum in Paris, uh, Ipril Mundo and, and basically we did an iteration of the original digital grotesque by Benjamin Gillenburger and Mikhail Hans Meyer. So we started again with the same process to analyze the model, to subdivide the model in pieces, because again, it's always about uh, discrete elements, even for these super intricate things, you always to think in a discrete way. And this, for this specific, pro specific project was a very, very, very important uh, part of the project because all the pieces they need to go, uh, they had some constraints. First of all, they, they couldn't weigh more than 50 kilos because it was the maximum weight that two people would comfortably lift up. Uh, so that was one of the rules. And also the size of the pieces. They, we have a maximum size for the boxes that we will use to move the pieces from Switzerland to, to Paris. So, so basically, we have also constraint in size, which meant that we we have to be very smart in the way we divide the pieces, also to implement implement like some sort of substructure for the pieces to be assembled easily and seamless. So it's all you can see basically in this image, like all the detailing, the, the different pieces, and all those things. And and then we three printed them all. Uh, the material in this case is some sort of artificial uh, stone. Uh, which is uh, binded with some sort of epoxy resin. Uh, and the finishing is 
more than stone, I would say it's closer to con concrete, like the consistency or the strength or how hard or heavy it is, is probably closer to concrete than stone, to be honest, but technically it's some sort of artificial sandstone, um, like a, just purely chemically speaking. Um, so basically we have all those pieces, again, they were all saved uh, and assembled, well, First of all, in this case, we did a pre-assemble on, on, in Zurich to make sure that all the pieces were fitting properly and all the details were uh, fitting nicely, uh, which they did, or mostly <laughs> they did. And then we moved the whole set of pieces to the Pompidou Museum, assembled them, and have this uh, piece uh, during, like, for the exhibition. Uh, as far as I know, it stayed there as a part of the, the of the collection now, of the modern art collection for the Pompidou Museum. And then after this project, uh, or about this time, uh, I started to think in a different approach, because then I was introduced for, from some colleagues about augmented reality for manufacturing and all the processes. And since I had a very wide experience programming robots, I realized that robots are very useful, but they are not smart at all. So basically they will do whatever you program, but they will not do anything else. And I was thinking that for some processes that is not functional at all. So with this AR approach, I thought, okay, so why if instead of using automation through robots, why don't use automation through humans? And we automate them by using augmented reality. So we started this agenda like uh, almost four years ago, or like, the process we started four years ago, we are teaching this for a few years already uh, at the Barlow School of Architecture. So we decided to start uh, to test just the technology to see which uh, were the constraints or all the possibilities for the technology. So first year we focused on materiality and we were researching materials and crafting methods that could be applied for uh, augmented reality. So in this case, we're working with some sort of thermoplastic. And as you can see, it was a very crafty way, a very handmade process, self-standing handmade process, all run by the augmented reality display. So they have this uh, plastic that they will pre-melt. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very interesting plastic because it melts very low, but once hardened, then it's quite strong. So it's very interesting. And also we add to the mix like with the plastic, we add also fiberglass. So it uh, increased the strength of the plastic uh, quite intensely, intensively. And also it melted uh, in a higher temperature after hardening, which uh, was very interesting for us. So we have uh, this uh, vector field approach. So we could control the vector field and then get those sort of pyramids to the vector field and the students could also interact uh, with gestures, which was also one of the things we wanted to try test uh, with augmented reality. Uh, sorry. So basically they had this sort of display uh, for assembling the, the whole grid. Uh, and was a super <laughs> fun project, I want to say. And then they ended up with some sort of installation for the final exhibition. Um, Obviously, in this case, the approach was more to test the technology than to test the architecture. Uh, but we were very happy in a way that for being the first year, we were able to really achieve a full AR manufacturing process. Uh, second year, we started to approach more traditional construction, construction materials, like in this case, wood, steam bent wood in this case. Um, similar approach, we have some um, gesture design processes attached to the to the platform for AR, and also in this case we were working with external frame since it was a, a steam boot. Uh, we use a frame to harden the boot in place, but everything was fixed using the AR device. So basically, they had this projection on top of the frame, which was also projected, so they could allocate all the pieces uh, together in the frame. And um, also the frame will, or the, the projection, the AR projection will also uh, help all the people to locate 
uh, all the brackets, uh, fixtures, and, and the boot position. That was a very interesting process for us because it was a super complex method that all the students without any previous experience on boot were able to deliver by using the AI. So, so for us, it really opens the eye for us saying that, okay, this is really a way to automate people with technology. They had this sort of proposal and they ended up making this huge thing that uh, was exposed for the last, <laughs> for now, uh, the pro show. Uh, and then this is the current approach uh, for the last year. In this case, again, we continue with more traditional materials for architecture, but with different uh, manufacturing approaches that will be enhanced by using the AR in this case. Uh, we were aiming for clay. Uh, we did some tests with clay and with a threaded method. So we would thread some sort of molds and then apply clay and then glaze it. Uh, it was a specific type of rock, so it will just burn out in the, in the, in the kiln. So it's not risky or will not affect the clay in any way. So then also we realized that we developed this platform so everybody could have access to it. And basically all the molding was made in AR. Everybody will use a very simple system of joints and sticks to create any, every piece. And then the threaded method to generate the pattern around the block. So the idea then is to analyze those patterns. And as you can see, uh, we also implemented some computer vision in order to read the patterns. So to really, in a genetic way, to have a reciprocal connection. So it will read the pattern, implement the pattern, recalculate the pattern, and also reproject the pattern. Um, we have a very, very, uh, this year, unfortunately, with all the situation, we couldn't really test, test much of the material, uh, which was a shame, to be honest, because uh, this project had a super amazing pieces before the pandemic. But we ended up like, doing this sort of uh, facet system proposal, which we think we could, it could adapt very well for, for the material, like uh, more than just a cladding, a more a three-dimensional approach to, to a facet. And that is uh, basically a very quick uh, summary of what I'm doing now and what is my research about. So thank you very much for <laughs> listening. Uh, thank you very much. Hello there, thank you very much, Alvaro. Like uh, really, uh, really exciting uh, new stuff. So I have a quick question, Alvaro. Just something I'm passionate about and uh, I'd like to understand better. Did you do anything related to bioprinting? I did uh, a few years ago, one project about it. Um, I say not very successfully, but I did. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so, Maybe I can answer your questions. Like if you have uh, about this is where it was some sort of uh, gel, like bio gel that will have some sort of uh, algae on it. Uh, yeah, like agaga, right? It's mm -hmm. like um, yeah, seaweed uh, gel. Yes, yes. Uh, it was more like a ground algae, algae like uh, it was not seaweed or anything like that. It was from uh, not sea <laughs> environment. <laughs> Not always like a made made in a lab or no 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 I mean that it's not from the sea like it's an old guy that lives in in the rocks basically oh I see okay that's so, cool so so it's a specific type of guy um, and I mean it was let's say partially successful like uh, we tripped into some sort of pattern and it grew in some places but in some other places it didn't I think because I have the feeling that the process is pretty aggressive for it in general. So mm -hmm. also, I'm not sure about how well distributed is the, is the seed for the algae or if it is not affected by the process because obviously you need to heat up a bit the material and also it will be exposed to the aluminum of the nozzle and maybe with more research in the proper uh, nozzle or uh, extruder technology would be easier, I can imagine, because uh, the materials we usually use, they are very aggressive with this sort of form, the life forms, mm -hmm. because aluminum, brass, uh, those materials are very, very harmful for, for 
uh, live elements in general. That's why uh, usually door handles, traditional door handles are made out of brass is because they kill basically yeah. every pathogen on them. Nothing can grow on them. Yeah, so, I, would, I wouldn't say every single pathogen. No, not, not even, but they have a very... They, they do kill a lot. Yeah, very powerful silver, uh, uh, killing <laughs> power, yeah. 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 So, so, so yeah, probably there are maybe through ceramics, I, I can imagine ceramics would be the way to go here. Uh, obviously, it's more expensive, but for sure, it, it would be nicer for, for this sort of material. That's my guess. Never tried. Uh, okay. purely, purely guessing here from... Okay. There is another another quick question uh, uh, for Alvaro. Have you played with a non-plana oh, yeah. segmentation of the 3D printed concrete pieces? Yeah. In fact, the first, like the the, the column was not planar. It was, uh, they were like cap base or irregular cap base uh, joints. And also uh, for uh, some of the pieces uh, in the in the digital grotesque, they were not planar. Also, they were like uh, following because we have very specific details we wanted to to keep. So basically, we had to cut them in a three dimensional way. Um, it is possible. Obviously, it requires a bit more technology and work on this type of journey, but I don't see it as a problem. 